I volunteered to be the moderator for the, this session because of my interest in my past history dealing with some alternative crops and uh, I um, filled the, the agenda a little bit with some of the work I did uh, when I was a research associate at the University of Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin. And again, just kind of reiterate a lot that's already been said. Um, there was some circumstances with malting barley. The producers in the Bighorn Basin were really upset with uh, the uh, brewing companies in terms of the, the markets that they were being offered, the contracts they were being offered. And so um, as a as part of the extension service, we went out and started trying to find some other crops. And we had a producer that moved into the area from South Dakota, and he was pretty familiar with growing sunflower, so we teamed up with him. So real quickly, this is uh, some work that we did um, on um, sunflowers, both confection sunflowers and oil sunflowers. And as you can tell, uh, th this is a confection uh, sunflower seed head. They're huge. Um, because the size of the seed matters um, when it comes to confection sunflowers. These are the sunflowers that you buy uh, and shell and eat um, from spats or whatever company you're, you're eating your sunflower seeds from. Um, the uh, sunflower over here uh, on the right hand side of the screen is an oil sunflower and it's, uh, oil sunflower seeds are much smaller um, and they're actually there for the oil content. So those are some of the differences. This is just a real brief um, summary of some of the work talking about plant populations, fertilizer programs, those kinds of things. Um, those are all learning curves when you're dealing with uh, a relatively new crop for your area. So be aware of that. Um, Ryan Larson talked a lot about um, contracting and, and some of these, and, and so is Orson. <clears throat> uh, I thought this would be interesting and so I think a little bit unique. Across the top there I have seed size. This is for confection sunflowers and these are um, of inches. So that's 22 sixtieths of an inch. So um, a typical contract for a confection sunflower grower uh, you have two choices. You could do a contract uh, where you get $30 a hundredweight for every seed over a 2060 force, um, and then split that contract at $16 uh, for everything under the 2060 force. Or at that time, you could actually do a straight contract at $26 for the contract. And I just wanted to show you um, quickly in terms of the um, some of the differences. So these are grow these are two varieties. There's a blue black variety and a blue variety. They both yielded the same. The 9569 yielded 2600 pounds, but it was 89.6 percent uh, 2060 force. So that was $699 an acre. And then the remaining 271 pounds at 16 cents. So you had a total of $742 an acre of gross return. And then the uh, 9530 had a higher percentage of larger seed. So you actually saw um, a, an opportunity for a greater return uh, simply because of seed size. Um, notice that I've also got in, in red the 2260 force. And notice the contract nowhere says or is stated in that contract where they'll pay you a premium for anything larger than 2060 force. And that's pretty typical of a lot of these contracts. So these 2264 seeds were a lot more valuable, but they're not going to actually pay you anything more for them. But they're going to certainly discount you or dock you for anything smaller than 2064. And that's how they set up contracts. So um, something that you know that you have to take into consideration that uh, you need to know the quality of your crop as well as. Uh, some of the other uh, actual production processes of, of, of that crop. Um, and then um, Mike just spent some time talking about uh, some of these other alternative crops, um, but I also did some work with uh, canola, and this, this work is uh, probably about 10 years old now, so it, you'll notice that Roundup Ready and conventional, I don't know if you can even buy conventional canola 
seed. Um, and I'm saying that jokingly, but uh, the canola industry, of course, is primarily in Canada um, and in the Dakotas, but uh, there are Roundup Ready, Liberty Link, and Clearfield varieties of canola. And there's also winter varieties and spring varieties. Uh, this gives you a little bit of idea of um, around how, how much Roundup makes a difference in weed control and overall uh, effect of the quality of the, of the canola seed. And I think that holds true in almost all of our crops. Um, and then this uh, new technology of these uh, other um, methods and weed programs, one thing that you might be able to take into consideration when you start looking at that risk reward uh, that Dr. Larson talked about, um, one of your rewards for maybe doing a canola crop or some of these specialty crops is maybe uh, simply to clean up a field. Maybe you want to, uh, you have a, uh, you've been using a Roundup system for quite a while and maybe it's uh, an opportunity for you to come in with a, a potential crop with a Liberty Link, for example. So that's something to think about. Some other things that we can get from these oil crops, uh, of course, human consumption, there's a, you know, sunflower oil, canola oil, um, are all competitive oils with soybean. And you know, uh, you know, soy soybean is the king of the oil oil seed industry. So um, that drives the market. But there's some niche markets there uh, for some of these other types of uh, oil seed crops. The meal uh, after these crops are crushed, the meal becomes livestock feed as a byproduct. Uh, there's quite a bit of demand for some of these byproducts out of these oil seed um, pressing mills and some of those things. And so there's, it, they make some really good. Uh, livestock feed and then of course uh, the biodiesel and the energy industry um, using some of these oils in terms of uh, um, blending with or making uh, biofuel. Uh, just quickly to mention some of the other crops that I've worked with um, and, and, and looked a lot like uh, what Mike has worked with as well as camelina, soybean and flax or some of the other oil crops I've worked with. And then I did some work with some um, legumes uh, some lentils, chickpeas, dry beans, dry peas. And then in the forage side of things, I've worked with sandpoint, grass seed, cool season grasses, warm season grasses. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, my experience and some of the things that I think is really exciting working with these specialty crops um, and these uh, alternative crops because there's, there's a lot of potential there, but there's a very steep learning curve. So uh, with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to go into uh, our panel discussion. And on our panel discussion, um, we have myself, Mike uh, Pace, that's already been in, uh, introduced. Uh, Dr. Creech, Earl Creech is on our panel. Uh, Dr. Creech is the ag ag agronomy extension specialist. Uh, he received his uh, PhD from Purdue University. He has a wealth of knowledge about everything from alfalfa to weeds. Um, if I could have thought of a crop that ended in Z, I would have thought of something that you were an expert in with the Z too, Earl. Um, and then Jake Hatfield. Jake Hatfield is an extension agent out of Cache County, and he is part of the Safflower and Oilseed Research Team. So uh, with the uh, four of us, we will now open it up. Uh, for discussion um, on anything oilseed crops. And I did see uh, one, one question earlier about um, marketing or selling your oilseed crops or maybe even sandpoint, uh, or not, excuse me, not sandpoint, soybean uh, in, in the state of Utah. So um, any of you have experience with that? Um, feel free to chime in. I, I'll take that. I answered it in the, in the chat box there, but uh, most of it here in Utah, in northern Utah at least, is going to, for safflower, is going to Wheatland Seed in uh, Brigham City or up into uh, Mountain States Oil Seeds up in Weston, Idaho. I don't know if, you know, there used to be a crushing plant or, excuse me, a plant over in uh, Colorado on the border there, but I don't think it's there any longer, so. That's the main thing with a lot of these in growing these crops is they'll grow and we can do them well, but uh, you know, where's the market at? Where have you got to truck them to? 
Yeah, when, when you start having to haul them long distances, then you you start carving into profit margins really quick. And so, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one for us to deal with. The sunflower issue that we had in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, um, all all those sunflowers were contracted through Dahlgren, and they came in and they paid freight and everything on them, and they hauled them through back to Minnesota. So. Um, at that time, they were really wanting the sunflowers. Um, anyway, um, what are you using for weed control in Sanfoin, um, Earl? <laughs> Where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you feel that, and then I'll see. If, I, I don't. I, I'll let you do that one. I guess. Have you? Um, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I'm not, I'm not, nothing, nothing great's coming up to me now, but let me, when I, when I get off, I can, I can look that up and type that in the chat. I just need to refer to a couple things, make sure I don't make an off-label recommendation. I do know we did quite a bit of research on it there in, in Wyoming, and we were messing around with glyphosate with small, small rates, um, which... Uh, I guess there is a, a producer um, up in Great Falls, Montana, that advocates and, and promotes his sandpoint, which is Rocky Mountain Remont, as being uh, glyphosate tolerant. Um, I think you need to be really careful when you start doing that. So uh, I'm not going to go on record on saying, oh, spray it with 12 ounces of Roundup. But um, I know guys that are doing it. And anyway. And then to kind of, I guess it depends a little bit on what your stand is too, in terms of is it a new stand or did you know what's the age of your stand and what kind of weed pressure you have too. So and then standard standard disclaimer, always read and follow label directions. <laughs> if it's not on the label, we didn't recommend it. Randall, there's a question there from Matt Yost saying, is there room in the sapphire market for large additions of irrigated acres? Um, I, can, I can take a stab at that one. If you look at the uh, sapphire acreage, California is, is number one. And then you've got the Dakotas and Montana and then Utah and Idaho. And those five or six states will usually make up about uh, 190 thousand acres of safflower and uh, you know you kind of see if, if wheat's a good price you'll see more acres in wheat if wheat's you know kind of staying the same and not a lot of room there you'll see people will dabble with that depending upon what kind of contract prices are being offered for some of these you know safflower and other small crops so I, I, I think there is room for that but uh, yeah, I, I and then the question above it was kind of like, okay, would you do it without a contract? No, I'm not that big of a risk taker, but maybe some people would do it without a contract. You know, the scary thing with that is, is if you don't have a contract and there's no place to put it, you better have a granary or something like that to put it in the fall time of the year. Or you're hosed, as Earl Creech would say. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. I would, I would, I would be really leery of growing some of these crops without contracting, without some support. You got to remember that, you know, I mentioned the company Dahlgren with sunflowers. They were tremendous support. They, they funded a lot of the research that we did, and then they were, they have, they have field men as well, and they were in there advising and crop, you know, crop advising, and giving as much uh, input and resources as we were. So. Um, if, if you contract a crop, you're, you're not going to be going it alone. Now you are, you know, you're going to take on mother nature risk in terms of drought and hail and all that stuff, but you're going to get some advice and you're going to, you're going to have a place to take, take your crop, uh, w when you harvest it. So I don't see anything else. Um, I guess soybeans have been grown in, you. oh, um, in Utah, but they haven't been very profitable. Earl may have more info on what varieties can be grown um, on soybeans. Yeah, so 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 we've so I I was 
even though I grew up here in Utah, I was trained as a soybean agronomist in the Midwest at Purdue and learned a lot about it there. And, and I've done research on soybeans every year since I've been at Utah State. And one thing that we've learned is that the, so they, they soybeans are, are, are kind of classified by maturity group. And so we would typically, here, here we would grow a one to a 1.3 maturity group. So something like a, a group six or seven would be grown in Mississippi. And we want to grow a shorter season variety. So you, you do something like that. And all the big seed companies have really good varieties in that, in that area that'll do well. Um, and typically our yields are about 60 bushels to the acre. So we haven't quite figured out how to push high yields in soybeans here. And I think in our high dollar land and our under irrigation, I think we need to find a way to be up in the 80 to 90 bushel range is really, really pushing the, the limit, but we, we, aren't, we are not quite there. So I don't know that that's a crop quite ready for the big time here in Utah, but the varieties that we have today are a lot better than we have in the past. And so I think there is some hope that in the future we may be able to get into it. Another thing to consider is uh, we've, we've done quite a bit on forage soybean. So growing soybean instead of harvesting it for grain, we cut it for hay or chop it and put it in a silo. And that stuff will grow. There you'll grow a group seven bean. So you'll grow that Southern environment soybean because they grow huge. They'll grow up to your, about up to your shoulders in height. So yield wise, they're really good. Make a really nice hay. And so that that could be a could be a nice option, but for grain, uh, prob probably not yet. But maybe someday we'll keep we'll keep playing with it.